first involved in advocacy. In 1975, Church Bosberg, a Washington attorney and head of a fledgling new historic preservation organization, Preservation Action, hired Nelling to be its president, and immediately Preservation Action became a key factor of preservation legislation. In 1976, Nelly and a network of citizen activists helped convince key members of Congress to add the first federal tax incentives for historic preservation to legislation that year. Four years later, Preservation Action has lobbied and allies lobbied successfully to get Congress to pass the first major amendments to the National Historic Preservation Act. A year later, under President Reagan, she was in the thick of discussions that resulted in a 25% federal income tax credit for the rehabilitation of historic commercial buildings that has resulted in over $25 billion in private investment since the 1970s. During the 1980s, Nellie and Preservation Action helped to defend the tax credit against abolition, and in 1991, she and the Preservation Lobby played important roles in passage by Congress of the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, which was also called ICT which required state departments of transportation to spend billions of dollars on environmental enhancement along the nation's highways, including historic preservation projects. Through it all, Nellie has maintained her sense of perspective, her contagious optimism, sense of humor, and ability to bring people together to make enlightened public policy. She now serves as a preservation consultant and chief executive officer of the Center for Preservation Initiatives in Washington, of special interest to us at Ball State, she has been a preservation educator for a number of years at the University of Pennsylvania, Columbia University, George Washington University, and Goucher College, teaching the politics of historic preservation uh, to students interested in going to preservation careers. She has received many special honors and awards, including an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from Goucher College, the Trustees Award for Outstanding Achievement in Public Policy, and the Gordon Gray Award for Outstanding Achievement in Support of Historic Preservation in the United States both for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, a presidential citation from the American Institute of Architects, uh, and a cultural achievement award from the U.S. Department of Interior. She's especially proud of having received a low fellowship in environmental science at Harvard University. And we must not overlook the crowning recognition of his career being listed in the National Register of Historic Places by the National Park Service. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess you know how old I am, because you can't do all those things and still be young and whatever. But anyway, I am. I'm also the mother of three children, and I'm happy to say that one of them is an environmental lawyer, and that, I think, is terrific. The, the other two, one is in computers, and the other is a wine person, a wine distributor. So I think I've got it made with wine, computers, and law, particularly environmental law. But anyway, I'm extremely honored to be to have this invitation to speak to you all uh, on my favorite subject, which is historic preservation and politics. I will share with you 26 years of effort to educate the Congress of the United States and federal agencies that preservation is good for America, and it deserves their support. It's been a road traveled with many obstacles, most of which have eventually been overcome. It is a road not traveled alone, but one that has involved constituents throughout our nation, including many from the Hoosier State. It starts with a phone call from me and an interview. As Jim mentioned, preservation action was an idea that needed implementation. The idea, a grassroots lobby for historic preservation uh, that would lobby the United States Congress for changes in law that would make our law policy more, uh, more conducive for rehabilitation of historic structures. I was enthusiastic, but I had a huge learning curve. I really had to learn about preservation needs, and I had to work and learn the, the legislative process. 
preservation action or preservation needs at that time were very simple. This is 1976. Tax laws favored new construction and had to be changed. I really became impassioned when I learned that the Stock Exchange building in Chicago, a Lewis Sullivan building, was demolished for an end of the year tax write off. It was a fabulous building. In fact, it was so fabulous that the trading room has been recreated in the Art Institute of Chicago. And the arch is in the sculpture garden. Initial contacts with Congress staffers revealed that they were sympathetic to our problem. And they were a great support for a rookie lobbyist in their midst. Quickly, I learned that Preservation Action idea of a grassroots advocacy organization was brilliant. You know, there are over 30,000 lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Most of these represent very large corporations, and they have many dollars to support congressional campaigns. Quickly, I realized that preservation action didn't fit that profile. We are not an industry with deep pockets. Our access to legislators has to be one to provide the impact, negative and positive, of legislation on our local communities. You tell your congressman how it's going to affect the area that he's representing in Washington, D.C. Members want to know this, and it's our responsibility to do this often. Building up a trust between you and your congressional representative and their staff, and having them be aware of your local preservation efforts. Luckily for me, a tax bill was on the DACA. I followed every bit of advice that anyone would give and learned that there was a proposal to level the playing field by offering a small tax credit for the rehabilitation of commercial historic buildings, but was told that, quote, the revenue estimate is too high so it will not make it into the tax bill. Revenue estimate, I thought, what was that? Well, it's an estimate of tax loss to the federal government and to the Treasury that is prepared by the Treasury. So I thought, well, maybe I should try to find the person who gave this, who put together this revenue loss in the Treasury. So I picked up the telephone. And when I called and the Treasury operators answered, they would say, I would say, I would like to talk to the estimator, tax estimator for historic preservation. And they would go, what? And I would say, historic preservation. And they'd say, oh dear, um, well, why don't we try so-and-so? So I talked to many people. And finally, I found the estimator. He confessed quickly that he lived in a historic house in historic Waterford, Virginia. That was the really good news. I ascertained that he could change the estimate if he had better numbers to work with. And then I began the calls to the National Park Service, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, all the people who could give him information that we thought would be valid and help him change his estimate. The outcome was he changed the estimate. and. Our amendment made the tax bill, and it was the first tax credit for rehabilitation of historic structures. It was small, but it was very helpful. During the next year, as these tax credits got to be used, a young congressman, Dick Gebhardt, who I think all of us know now, uh, wanted to have a hearing to really check on how they were working, and he decided the hearing should be in Chicago because that is where the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee lived. You see how all these things go together? How you string them together. Well, anyway, at that time, Dan Rostenkowski was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, and he was a prickly but really brilliant legislator. And as part of this hearing, he boarded a bus with four other congressmen to tour neighborhoods that would benefit from the tax credit if we could get it through. As only a chairman could do, he got sort of restless in other members' neighborhoods. So he went up to the bus driver and he said, bus driver, I want you to go into my neighborhood. And he said to the Park Service people, you tell me where it's going to work in my neighborhood. And the upshot was he became a tremendous supporter 
of an enhanced tax credit for commercial historic buildings. This was a 25% tax credit. And he tucked it right into the 1980 Tax Recovery Act package. Its success over 25 years is legendary. Since 1976, it has produced $25 billion in private investment, 29,000 historic rehabs have been certified in 1,700 cities and towns throughout the nation. Thousands of housing units have been produced. 60,000 housing units for low and moderate income tenants. Each project creates an average of 45 new jobs. And this program has renewed an interest in the building arts. Things looked quite good. But then, as, as we know in Washington, along came a Tax Reform Act in 1986, which became a real downer for our historic credit. Because they made us subject to the passive loss rules, which we're not going to go into, but it's something that has taken almost 15 years to really recover from. The use of the credit was going up from 1980 to 1986, and then it just crashed and it's gradually been recovering. Last year, uh, it hit a new high for the first time. $2.6 billion in private investment was put into historic rehab in 315 cities. 12,800 12, housing units were created, of which 2,900 were for low and moderate income families. Now, you've heard me say low and moderate income families, because that's very important, as we'll talk about a little later. As this tax program was growing, as we were working for increased funding, Preservation Action itself was growing. Preservation Action was developing a board of 160 members. You might say 160 members. Well, we wanted representation in as many of the states as we could get, because we were using constituents as the real source of getting information to their own members of Congress. We had an executive committee of 35 and a management committee. We had all those good things. And, but we had a very small staff. Two to three people was all we needed. And we operated on a triangle basis. The staff would be talking to people in Congress or their staff members. That we would also be talking to constituents when we needed letters or we needed calls or whatever. The constituents would talk to the staff people. And we just had a nice triangle with everybody on the same, uh, they were all together working to, to be understood and helping get the, the support of the members for whatever we wanted. Lobbying for a number of people, because now that we had all these board members, we were asking them to lobby the Congress. Well, you know, lobbying the Congress can be a rather terrifying event if you stop and think about it. For instance, at one point, I asked Reed Williamson, who's the president of the Historic Landmarks of Indiana, if he would help. And Reed said to me, Nellie, I don't know the tax code of the United States. I'm running a preservation organization. And he said, I would feel very uncomfortable going into some congressman's office to talk taxes, because that's not really my field. And I said to Reed, you don't have to talk taxes. We're trying to get a tax credit that will really help our communities work. And I think if you go take a map of Indianapolis into the office. At this time, it was Representative Andy Jacobs. You might be able to show him where this credit would work. And sure enough, the two of them poured over the map. And Congressman Jacobs was so convinced and so excited. And he said, don't worry. He said, I just married another member of the Ways and Means Committee. So now you've got two votes for this visit. I should also add that Preservation Action has a lobbying day in Washington each March. And it joins together with other organizations, such as the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers 
and the National Trust and legions of preservationists go up to Capitol Hill. It's fun, it's exciting, and everyone is prepared with issue papers and talking points. But as the historic preservation program has grown, the law has also changed to reflect this. And there have been amendments to the law in 1980, in 1992, and 1999. The program, for those of you who don't know, and a reminder for those who do, is housed in the National Park Service at the federal level of government within the Department of Interior. The Park Service is ably assisted by the State Historic Preservation Offices, of which there is one in every state, district, and territory. The states match the federal dollars by at least 40% and assist in all aspects of historic preservation. They assist in the nominations to the National Register. They assist in the administration of those tax incentives that we were so lucky to have. And they also pass money on through to certified local governments, which were now a part of the program. In 1992, the law expanded to include Native Americans as partners in the National Historic Preservation Program. Like local governments, tribes must meet certain standards, but then tribes and Native Hawaiians get to control their own historic preservation programs. As I've described this, it's an excellent example of federalism. In fact, many people think it's one of the best. It's a partnership where the money flows down from the federal government through the states to the local governments or tribes, and all of the sticks are in the ordinances at the local level. In other words, the community votes how it wants to handle historic preservation. It does not come down from the Park Service telling you what you have to do. And I think that's a very important distinction of our program. Preservationists are therefore are always seeking an appropriate balance of carrots and sticks. And like a scale, knowing that an incentive must be available to offset the regulations that may go with doing a certified rehabilitation. But let's get back to lobbying in the Congress and problems that needed attention. Let's go back to before many of you were even born. Let's go back to the 60s and 70s when urban renewal came in and destroyed vast areas of city from coast to coast. This was further exasperated by our transportation policy that created the interstate highway system. And they built the highways right through the heart of many cities throughout the country. I don't know if any of you have ever taken 95 from New York up to New England, but it's really pathetic how you find one half of towns like New London and New Bedford on one side of this huge wide highway and the heart just removed. Preservationists watched as the Pennsylvania Railroad Station in New York City was demolished and became a pile of rubble. And on top of the rubble were broken, magnificent Beaux art statues. That wonderful building gave way to one of the most insignificant structures you can ever see. And that still remains a bane on the landscape of New York City and their efforts to get rid of it. Efforts to demolish Grand Central Station, also at this time, were stopped by the Supreme Court of our country. And now, as you may know, one of the most exciting places to be in New York City is in the restoration of that Grand Central Station. Many organizations shared a belief that our transportation policy needed major reform, that the opposition to reform had deep pockets. That included the concrete industry, truckers, and states who wanted decision-making in their own departments of transportation with lots of money flowing down from the federal government. In 1991 and 92, a coalition formed to make transportation programs and funding support 
livable communities, not to destroy them. The grassroots of America really joined together and surprisingly did change the policy of our transportation, of our federal transportation program. Ice-T, as Jim mentioned, uh, as it was called, would require that 10% of highway monies must be reserved for enhancements. That is conservation, preservation, the trails, I think every town got a trail out of this one, and museums all qualified for funding. And it's big money, 10% of what they use for the highway program is in the billions. State transportation agency were not happy and they hoped that this program would not last for more than the seven years it was authorized. So in 1990, 1999, when transportation policy was again before Congress, there was a big effort to get rid of the enhancements. Bud Schuster, who was the, who'd been the chairman in 1992, was the leader of this movement to get rid of the enhancements and get transportation and highway building back to what it had been before this had happened. He put out a bill, and he went to the members of the House of Representatives for co-sponsors, and out of 417 members, he could only get 22. Why? Because every member had a trail or had a railroad depot that had been fixed up as a result of these ice tea monies. So the excitement is that the new law continues, and enhancements continue, They've added a couple new categories. So we will see thousands of com communities over the next seven years benefit from enhancements that make our communities more livable than ever. Grassroots lobbying has been a constant effort to respond to Congress with the right facts. Very often you're dealing with something and you cannot believe what comes out of a member's mouth. For six years, we have lobbied very hard to extend the commercial tax credits to homeowners of historic properties. The need for such a credit can be seen almost in every city where there's sort of a donut of, of houses that need to be fixed up and neighborhoods that need to be brought back. The, the credit a homeowner's credit would ensure appropriate restoration and the community would once again become an attractive place to live and work for all income levels. The proposal is widely supported in the House and Senate. However, two years ago there was a discussion of this before the Ways and Means Committee and one of the members, Representative Charles Rangel, suddenly stood up in the committee and he said, excuse me, but he said, historic preservation is for the rich. It's an elitist thing. We are not going to support a homeowner tax credit for the rich. This was a total misstatement. And the big question is, how do we handle this? Fortunately, through the good services of the National Park Service, a computer created an overlay of historic districts and census tracts throughout the entire country. The results are astonishing. Over 53% of historic districts are in census tracts where the income is 20% below median state income. We are not just for the rich. We conveyed this information to Congressman Rangel and as you can, I'm sure you would expect, he has become one of the staunch supporters of moving this through. But that's the kind of thing that we, we have to clarify very quickly because it's the kind of word that spreads around. Now, while this information was very helpful in clarifying the error on the homeowner's tax credit, unfortunately, we have faced six years of no tax bill. So it really wasn't able to go anywhere. And now, we have two tax bills, but they are both economic stimulus packages that flow to corporate rebuilding rather than community rebuilding. Since 1976, 
preservation issues are flowing through many agencies of government, agencies that we've never dealt with before. Defense. The military is concerned about the cost of maintaining its historic properties. The Army has the largest number of historic properties in the federal government, 12,000. And answers to this are being explored by the National Trust and a group of consultants. Historic military properties are an asset, but they will require some policy changes within the military as well as some legislative changes to bring the private sector in to help not only the military, but also to help, to help themselves and make these things and make this housing come alive without spending defense dollars on housing. Agriculture. Agricultural programs have not been open to most preservation issues. And as you look through the landscape, you see barns falling down and archaeological resources suffering from the deep plowing techniques that destroy known sites, including Indian mounds and burial sites. Change may be coming, however, because the Farm Bill is now being considered by Congress. And in the Senate version, there are two provisions that are very interesting. The first is the Farmland Protection Program, which is a very popular program right now, would have a new category of eligibility added. And historic buildings, objects, and archaeological sites could apply for funding from this very popular program. Farmers and ranchers could place easements on identified sites and receive annual income based on the production and income the land previously provided. And that would give us a chance to hold these sites for some time and give us a chance certainly to, to offer, as I say, a look at, the, at, the, at our past. A bill was offered by Senator Jim Jacobs, Jeffords, excuse me, of Vermont, that would create a grants program for barns with a million dollars a year to stimulate funding over a five-year period. And I think that would be very important to Indiana. The archaeological provision resulted from a grassroots effort engineered by the Society of Historical Archaeologists. The challenge that, we were, that they were given was no new programs and no new funding. Meeting the challenge was accomplished by a one-line addition to the big farming bill that did include historical and archaeological resources. And it just may result in saving important evidence of our earliest inhabitants, and it may be a valuable tool against sprawl. The newest problem? The Federal Communications Commission, towers, communication wireless towers. You see them everywhere. The demand for wireless towers, for wireless service is increasing dramatically, and it's enhanced by the events of September 11th. Fortunately, the historic preservation law requires agencies to take preservation into consideration as a condition for siting projects using federal funds. Now, under this provision, the federal communications cannot put their equipment on a tower that has not been approved by the State Historic Preservation Office. So the tower building industry is a private industry. It's not affected by this law. But if they avoid the historic preservation process, they don't get anything hung on their towers and it means they are not going to make any money. The demand for, for wireless service, however, does cry for an expe expe expedited process on the other hand. A working group has been assembled, including industry, a federal agency, and preservation interest, including the state preservation officers. It's a slow process, but with 50 individual state programs, headway is being made to accommodate all interests. And hopefully we will have no more towers being placed on Indian mounds 
as happened in the past. Preservation and politics. It's always challenging. It's always needing attention. Decisions made in Congress, the State House, and the City Council can protect our valued history or destroy it. Grassroots advocacy can tip the balance, not with money, but with common sense political facts. What's the case for historic preservation? Here's the case. Historic preservation saves buildings, 29,000 under that tax credit. It builds partnerships between developers, preservationists, federal, state, and local agencies. And it promotes sound preservation practices. Historic preservation generates capital investment from the private sector, 25 billion through the tax program alone. It creates jobs. Each, each, uh, each job is, re is, or each preservation rehabilitation project creates an average of 40 jobs. It invites heritage tourism. It stimulates community renewal, Main Street renewal, center city office buildings, and it reuses existing infrastructure. No new sewers, no new schools. It provides affordable housing. It promotes stability. It increases property values. And it builds community pride. One last political insight, one of my favorites. President and Mrs. Clinton became very concerned about the funding needs of some of our most valued historic landmarks. To meet this need, they created the Save America's Treasures program. And they convinced Congress to funnel $30 million into the program, which would be matched at least one to one. And they did this for a, over a two year period, uh, which would mean that there would be 60 million going into the program. 60 million that would be leveraged to 120 million. And many places that you know have received this money from the Statue of Liberty to Montpelier to the York, Pennsylvania Farmer's Market, which is an old Amish market. When President Bush began his budget request, the first program he eliminated was the Save America's Treasures. We always expect that when a new party comes in, they don't want to be associated with programs that were started by the, the former president. However, not however, but anyway, we saw this, that th it was eliminated in his February budget blueprint. And he spelled it out very clearly that the program had, would cease to function. However, as the appropriations committees and Congress began their work, a letter arrived from the White House. And it said, please continue the Save American Treasures program at $30 million for fiscal year 02. We don't know exactly how it happened. I like to think maybe it was pillow talk in the White House because his, Mrs. Bush is known to be very supportive of preservation. She was a speaker at the National Trust meeting when it was in Fort Worth. But ever, anyway, the case was made and preservation is the clear winner. Grassroots advocacy does work. And you can join the effort by becoming an active member in your local preservation organization. So if you care about our nation's heritage, let your legislators know. In Congress, in the State House, and in the City Council. It works. Thank you. Would anyone like to ask any questions? Yes.
You've asked a very good question, and it's a question that Congress pondered over terribly. In fact, they pondered in 1986. They kept saying, we don't want any shopping malls to be getting money and having it called historic preservation. So there is something in the law for older buildings that says no building built after 1936 is eligible for the 10% funding. And the rest of it, we have to leave up to the historic uh, National Register nomination process. And we have to hope that people making those decisions are making decisions ba based on qualities that we do want to exist. But Congress was right where you are. Are there any other questions? Well, I thank you very much. I've really enjoyed my visit to Ball State, and I think you've got a wonderful school, wonderful professors, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I hope everyone has a much better grasp of how legislation happens and how the lobbying process can work. And LA is responsible for a lot of important litigation legislation that took place last time I hear this across. Now, there's an opportunity for you to meet and greet Kelly. Uh, she has a very interesting story to tell about some very prominent politicians she's known.